The thug is in. What is up, guys? This is Logan, also known as Alexi on Pokemon Showdown, and welcome to the Battle Factory Guide. The Battle Factory Gold Symbol is a notoriously difficult gold symbol to obtain in the Frontier because it's the only facility where you don't bring your own team, taking team building out of your control. There's no OP team to copy and steamroll through the facility, so I think it's quite fitting the symbol is called the Knowledge Symbol, because without the crutch of the team building adva advantage... Knowledge is power! Thanks, Nolan from Pokemon Masters EX. And now, I'm here to give you that knowledge. The knowledge to not only achieve that gold symbol, but to go even farther into the depths of the factory. Now... Before you even enter the factory, you gotta go to the battle tower and make sure that your current or previous streak is set to zero. This is because due to an odd bug in the game, the opponent's IVs are based on your current battle tower streak, not the streak in the battle factory. So what do the opponent's stats look like when your streak is at zero in the battle tower? Introducing my very sophisticated diagram with our wonderful volunteer, Gentleman Brennan, who by the way, really wants to see the news. The first six trainers in every round will always have three IV Pokemon. In rounds one and two, the seventh trainer will be a slight elevation with six IV Pokemon. In round three, the final battle is Noland, who will have 15 IV Pokemon. However, in all of the in all of the third rounds after that, Noland will have 31 IV Pokemon. This cycle continues as you can see for rounds four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Now, let's see how this compares to the IVs of your Pokemon for every round. Thankfully, there's no IV glitch with the Pokemon you receive in your draft, and every round your IVs slightly increase until they reach 31 IVs on round 7. While it's great that your Pokemon IVs increase every single round that you win, we can still see the difficulty of round 3 and round 6 emerge, as we look at the differences between the draft Pokemon IVs and Nolan's Pokemon IVs. This is compounded by the fact that every single time you swap for a Pokemon, those Pokemon's IVs are always going to be 3 IVs, which is a huge difference from 31 IVs. Thankfully, through the power of swaps though, you can actually increase the stats of your Pokemon every single round. Here's how. So, when you swap a certain amount of times, you will receive an elevated Pokemon in your draft. For example, on round 4, if you have 15 or more swaps, your first Pokemon to the left in your drafting process will be a round 5 Pokemon, which not only means that it has 20 IVs, but it's also a round 5 moveset, which is often better, unless you get the absolutely terrible round 5 Altaria. This is really helpful to contend with Nolan, because that means that if you have at least 22 swaps by round 6, you can have two perfect IV Pokemon. So here is a strategy for you to use. During rounds 1 and 2 of the Battle Factory, if you swap every single time you have the chance, which is 6 per round, meaning 12 swaps, you will guaranteed have an elevation, po elevation Pokemon on round 4 and above. Because every draft process or rental also counts as a swap. So 12 plus a swap for each round, 3, is 15, which gives you at least 1 elevation. And for reasons I'll explain very soon, it's still very easy to beat rounds 1 and 2 while you're swapping every single time you can. Now there is one last caveat regarding the IVs of your draft Pokemon. In round 9, for some unknown reason, all of the Pokemon in your draft will have random IVs, except of course the ones that elevate to round 10 where the IVs are still 31. There's going to be a pastebin in the description that'll explain this more thoroughly, but what this means is that Noland on round 9 is exceptionally difficult because not only do you have to contend with random IV Pokemon in your draft process, but by that point, all Pokemon can be 4 to 8 different sets. Speaking of which, let's talk about the actual sets that you'll be facing in the Battle Factory. So the main reason we actually do level 50 instead of level 100 to get a large streak is because in level 50, you can 100% know the opponent sets from rounds 1 to 7. Unlike in level 100, every single Pokemon right away can be 4 to 8 different sets. And as Nolan says, Knowledge is power! 
Anyway, let's say you encounter a Roselia in round one. You can know that it is Roselia 1 because it has a 1 next to its name. The same goes for round two. Roselia 1 is also in round two. It's not Roselia 2. In rounds one and two, you can only face Pokemon with a 1 after their name, such as Sudowoodo 1, for example. Now in round three, Every Sudowoodo is going to be Sudowoodo 2 because round 3 only has Pokemon with a 2 after their name. This might seem like a lot right now, but it's a lot e more easy to understand when you actually type a Pokemon in the calculator because Pokemon like Grumpig, for example, can only have two sets, as once you hit round 4, it's a completely new slate of Pokemon. First off, do remember though that when you're calcing, for example, Roselia versus Sudowoodo, to make sure that you make the opposing Pokemon three IVs if you're facing a regular trainer, and to account for what the IVs of your Pokemon are, such as three, six, or nine, it won't automatically change. You'll have to like click off and then go back to Roselia one, and then it'll have the three IVs that you want. Either way, let's say we face a round four Pokemon such as Feraligatr. How can we know what set it is? Well, on round four, it's always gonna be Feraligatr one, on round 5, it's always going to be Feraligator 2. On round 6, Feraligator 3. And on round 7, Feraligator 4. You will always know what these sets are. Now, what if we get to a Pokemon, though, like Metagross, which has 8 different sets? Well, the same rule applies. Round 4 is Metagross 1, round 5, 2, round 6, 3, and round 7, it's Metagross 4. And then on round 8, you can encounter any one of these Metagrosses, 1 through 8. And the same goes for Feraligator. If you find a Feraligator on round, on round 8, it can be any one of these sets, i.e. 4 to 8 different sets. With all of this set variety, it becomes a lot more important to try to figure out what the opponent's set is. And thankfully, we have a lot of helpful tools to figure that out. So, as the scientist takes you back into the factory, they give you two crucial pieces of information. The first one is that they'll tell you if the opposing trainer is skilled at handling a certain type of Pokemon. Here we can see they're skilled at handling the bug type. What this means is that there are guaranteed two bug type Pokemon on the opponent's side. So, an example team for round one could be a team of Anorith, Butterfree, and Magby. However, if this Magby was instead a Nose Pass, no type specialty would show up because there are now two Rock types and two Bug types, and they cancel each other out. You can use this information, especially in the later rounds of the factory, to have a better idea of what is possible for the last Pokemon of a trainer. Now, there is a rare exception to this, of course. If a trainer had a team of Roselia, Gloom, and Bayleaf, even though there are two poison types, the trainer would still be specialized in the grass type because they now outnumber poison. So let's look at what the scientist says next. So after the scientist tells us that the trainer specialized in a bug type, we move on to the next phrase. This, the scientist here says that their battle style appears to be slow and steady. And this is one of nine phrases that the scientist can tell you. And basically what it tells you is what kind of moves are going to be on the opponent's team. So here we see this as category two. If we scroll up all the way up to category two, we now know that there are gonna be moves like Will-O-Wisp, Thunder Wave, Swagger, Toxic, and Hypnosis on the opponent's team. Very, very annoying moves. How many specifically? Well, on the first three categories, one, two, and three, there needs to be at least three moves on the opponent's team to satisfy it. And then for the categories four to seven, there only has to be two. The farther you go down the category list, um, it'll like override the one before it. So even if you have five, if even if you have like three category two moves, if you have two category four moves, it'll show as category four, which is high risk, high return. And if they somehow satisfy more than three of them, you'll get a very special phrase, which is appears to be flexibly adaptable to the situation. So. How can we use this information to our advantage? So, I thought it would be helpful to show how this can all come together in something live. I'm gonna give you a live example. So, the opponent is skilled in the handling of the rock type, and they have high risk, high return as their style. Also, the spreadsheet that's in the bottom, I will link it in the description. It is the most helpful tool. So let's just see what we get for our draft. I'm just gonna draft something like, I mean, hold on. We got Regirock. Oh wow, this is a crazy draft. I mean, this is a nuts draft, but let's say I go Tauros, Regirock, Swampert, right? So we know that they have Rock-type as their specialty. 
and that they favor high risk, high return, which is style number four. Here comes youngster Logan leading out Golem. So now here what I would do is I'd go to my little species thing and I, I can type in Golem in the species column and all of the possible Golem sets will show up. Golem being on high risk, high return makes sense because as you can see, there's a lot of styles that have four in them. One quick thing to note that I thought was important to mention is that the order of the style numbers correlates to the order of the moves in the move slot. So for example, Golem 2 with 4613, that means Focus Punch is a style 4 move, Substitute is a style 6 move, Double Team is a style 1 move, etc. You get the point. Anyway, back to the example. And this Golem on the bottom would actually just complete it by itself. So then what I could do is I could do something like, uh, I mean, I could just Earthquake it um, and see what they try to click. Let's see what they have. Looks like they use Double Team. So now that we know that they use double team we can guarantee that they are golem 2 which also means that they have the item chesto berry another thing to note is that in emerald battle factory there's item claws so the opponent's next pokemon can't have a chesto berry we also know that it is absurdly unlikely for there to be another ground type in the back or else or else it would cancel out the rock type specialty so then let's say down goes golem right so let's see what comes out next. What comes out next is Armaldo. So if we go and type in Armaldo, then Armaldo, you know, can be any one of these sets. We don't actually get that much information from it. But for example, let's say if this golem was Quick Claw, we would know for a fact that Armaldo couldn't be Armaldo 2 or Armaldo 3. Also, using the damage calc is really helpful because sometimes you can suss out if they're a bulky set or a not bulky set, which helps you further kind of decide what set is the opposing Pokemon. And, you know, all these tools are just super useful. Another thing I figured I'd mention is that high risk, high return is easily the most common phrase because double edge is so such a common move that often, let's say that high risk, high return wasn't the phrase for this battle. When we first saw that golem, we would know that it is not golem 4 because it activates high risk, high return by itself. God, I don't really want to go back and edit it. So either way, another thing I figured I'd mention is that let's say again it wasn't high risk, high return and it was golem 3 for example. You now know that the two Pokemon in the back cannot have a high risk, high return move or else the phrase would have showed up. Um, so these are just multiple things that you can use to your advantage, especially in the later rounds when there's a variety of sets to get a higher streak in the Emerald Battle Factory. Now I'm going to talk about some brief strategy and things to watch out for in rounds 1 to 6 to help you achieve your gold medal. In rounds 1 and 2, creating a defensive backbone is key, as because the AI you are facing is completely random, if you have a water plus grass defensive core, it's almost impossible for the AI to get through. Some of the best Pokemon include God Clamperl, Roselia, Azumarill, Poliwhirl, and Gloom. Rock types like Pupitar and Sudowoodo are especially good as they have good stab options in Rock Slide and Dig and resist the plethora of garbage moves, garbage normal moves most Pokemon have. Minin is also insanely good with access to Encore because being able to lock the random AI into non attacking moves. In round two, Basically the same story, although ghost types like Sableye and Banette are insanely good with immunities to normal, and one of my favorite ses sets is Octillery, which they for some reason gave Octazooka, Aurora Beam, Rock Blast, and something else I forgot, which is just a great uh, round 2 set. In round 3, things get a lot more difficult, and there are a lot more threatening Pokemon in sets. Chansey, Scyther, and Grumpig, as well as Cloyster, shine above the rest with insane offensive and defensive qualities. If you see one of those four Pokemon on the opponent's team, even though they have three IVs and Nolan Silver Battle will have 15 IVs, you still take those Pokemon. They are must-haves on the team. Other must-haves are banded normals like Furret or Lanoon. They are very, very threatening. You should have some sort of plan versus them. However, thankfully they are telegraphed when an opponent will have them because if you see the scientists tell you that an opponent appears to be impossible to predict, it is very likely to be Furret as it has Trick plus Follow Me, and that is a very rare phrase to activate. This of course makes Rock-types very strong yet again. 
because the AI is still mostly random. And then in rounds 4, 5, and 6, I think the general team building philosophy holds. Having a defensive backbone is very important. However, I do think it's important to have a strong hitter on the team, as encountering double team strategies is inevitable. Don't be afraid to use seemingly uncompetitive strategies as well. Gardevoir 2 and Tauros 2 in round 5 are some of the best battle factory sets with double team plus rest and a strong stab option. And one of my favorite sets of all time is Gengar 1 in round 4. It's such a threat with Hypnosis plus Confuse Ray and Attract Shenanigans, making it very unlikely the opponent can get a hit off. If you want some more in-depth knowledge, Wildcat Formation, the current world record holder made an awesome guide on Reddit that you should totally read. You can also see my mindset where I took a million notes during my 104 win streak on Smogon. All of these links will be in the description. Whew, all right, there it is. There's the Battle Factory Guide for you guys. Thank you guys for watching. If you got this far, subscribe to my channel. I'm trying to see how far I can go. I've been getting so much support the past week, and I really appreciate it. Thank you for getting that video to over 100k views. That blows my mind. Um, and yeah, I'm going to be going live consistently, so make sure to hit the bell, do all that stuff, and join my Discord, and join the Battle Facilities Discord. That is super duper important. And either way... See you guys on the next video.